Welcome to Boundless Pursuit, a weekly podcast providing motivation, entertainment, and education to anglers and outdoorsmen. I hope that the stories you'll find here will encourage you to chase your passion more fervently, to open your mind to new opportunities and perspectives. Your engagement and feedback is critical to the growth of this show, and I would love to hear your suggestions on topics or potential guests. You can reach me at boundlesspursuitfishing at gmail.com or at my website, www.boundless-pursuit.com. That's where you'll find all related articles, media, and merchandise. Please remember, the show will gain traction from your support. Be sure to like, comment, and share this podcast to your friends and connections. I'm your host, David Graham. Now let's get on to today's episode. In early 2023, I caught the biggest fish of my life, a nine foot two white sturgeon pushing nearly 400 pounds. And it will certainly be the biggest freshwater fish I catch for maybe my entire lifetime. But that would have not been possible without today's guest, Steve Carroll. And Steve Carroll of Idaho specializes in the pursuit of this monster fish, but he does it with a unique edge because Steve is chasing these landlocked white sturgeon out of Idaho from land and from kayak, which paints a very down-to-earth and attainable picture of this endeavor, where you're mixing nine-foot-long fish with small watercraft, or simply boots on dry land. And it's very possible that Steve himself may have pioneered the pursuit of big white sturgeon from kayak. At least he's certainly recognized as one of the first within the sturgeon community. And the prospect of having a near 300-pound fish come rocketing out of the water mere inches from a small watercraft is frightening and exciting. But as wild as this pursuit is, chasing North America's largest freshwater fish, Steve is about as humble and mild-natured as they come. An engineer by trade, he's calm, he's calculated, and he's measured in everything that he does. But despite his calm disposition, this is a dude that gets seriously fired up over catching these giant fish. But what I really like about Steve, what I really admire about him, is he's gone beyond simply chasing the fish. And it's a common theme on this podcast that I like to bring in people that have day jobs, that are grinding just to find a few hours to get on the water. Because professionally, this is a guy who's tremendously talented in fabrication, engineering, manufacturing, and just building. And earlier this year, Steve meshed his talents for manufacturing and building with his passion for fishing when he launched his new business, Snake River Lockers, where he's custom building and designing kayak trailers and rod lockers built with precise engineering from the mindset of an angler. And when you think about any kind of product made in the fishing industry, you kind of get the feel that a lot of it is just mass production. Just produce, 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 smoke screens, bells and whistles, and marketing schemes designed to fool anglers into just buying the next greatest thing. But you wonder how many of these things are dreamt up and designed by people that are actually out on the water doing it, whose passion for producing is actually matched by a passion for fishing. And Steve is undoubtedly one of those guys. This is a guy that has taken a diehard passion for kayak fishing and building and put the two things together to create a tremendous product. Anglers who are interested in kayak fishing really need to take a look at the stuff that this guy's making. I had the great opportunity of seeing Steve in action during my visit in Idaho. I saw this guy fret over the tiniest little details and imperfections to make sure the thing that he was building for our trip was absolute perfection. I myself come from a manufacturing background. I'm in it to this day. So I admire the mindset that this guy has for quality of work and dedication to absolute perfection in what he's building. The rod lockers are sleek and efficient, and the kayak trailers are designed for anglers. So you're the first one in and the first one out at the boat ramp. This is one of the most down-to-earth, die-hard guys that I've had the pleasure of meeting and fishing with, and I owe this guy a lot. This is Steve Carroll of Idaho. It's kind of the hazards of sitting on my back porches. My neighbor could start mowing. Anything could happen in the background. But anyway, man, um, let's roll into this thing. I'm glad I finally got you on here. The reason why I'm so excited and why I consider you like a special guest. Everybody's special. All the guests are special. I have the best guests. This is the best (laughs) podcast in the world. Like and subscribe. 
Uh, <laughs> Uh, but you are like the guy that has put me onto my biggest fish ever. I believe that sturgeon is the biggest fish I've ever captured saltwater or freshwater, certainly freshwater. And I think it, was, it like, I think it's sitting in a position that I don't know that will ever fall anytime soon. So <laughs> I owe you like this debt of gratitude. Um, so I'm really got, glad I got you on here. Cause you, you, uh, man, that's that's a meaningful position to be in, you know what I mean? So appreciate your time getting on here. But yeah, no problem. Thank you for having me. But um, and and shout out to Josh Dolan, who, you know, mutual, mutual connection, another former oh, really? podcast guest, uh, just a fishy dude. But um your specialty is one that uh, is real interesting to me. Obviously, me being a guy who enjoys big fish and different kinds of fish. And takes pride in being an American, you know what I mean? Like the white sturgeon represents like our grand champion. Like, like it is Team America's heavyweight champion. So, so you know, <laughs> fish fall into all these different categories. <clears throat> the most beautiful, the fastest, the rarest, the most elusive, the most coveted for whatever reason it may be. But at some point, all of us as anglers in our core want to know, okay, that's great, that's cool, it's awesome what's the biggest and it's what's like the biggest? Yeah. i'm so envious of you because you live on this this unique fishery and i want to really dive into your fishery but you specialize in catching i i consider you a specialist in catching north america's largest freshwater fish but with an edge and that you're pursuing them out of kayaks so now that i've gone on my long rant i i don't think this conversation would 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 really develop properly if you didn't explain how that kind of came to be because most people don't just swing for the fences right off the bat like how did you begin pursuing <laughs> these giant fish from kayaks well, yeah so so it all started many many years ago on the snake river um you know i started i started fishing for catfish on the snake and uh, uh one day i had accidentally hooked a uh, a sturgeon i didn't even know the sturgeon were in the in the river and my uh, my uncle and I were fishing, and we had this competition going back and forth, like who's got the biggest catfish. And you know, at that moment, the record was like nine pounds or whatever. And um, you know, we see this rod just double over, and it, it's my rod. We're using cut bait, fish for catfish, and then the thing just starts screaming down river, and we see this monster animal. This what the heck is this thing? <laughs> Jumps out of the water, does this just crazy acrobatics. Right. And then ever since then I was ruined for catfishing. So I immediately started researching what was in the river and I found out it was, it was white sturgeon and on the snake river, um, the white sturgeon population that we have, uh, is what we're pretty much going to have, right. These fish normally would travel to the ocean, uh, spend a couple of years out in the ocean, come back. Um, <clears throat> but since the snake river has been dammed up, you know, with hell's Canyon, Brownlee, uh, Swan falls, and just all these other, other dams, part of the agreement with Idaho power for damming up the river was to maintain native fish populations. So because the sturgeon were already there, um, they have to continually, uh, raise hatchery sturgeon and, um, transplant sturgeon. So there's a couple stretches in the, in Idaho where the sturgeon self, um, they, they spawn naturally and they need a, they need a very specific set of conditions, um, to, to spawn. And, and, uh, those, those stretches are Hell's Canyon and CJ strike, uh, the CJ strike to bliss reach, uh, which is where, uh, you had caught your, your nine foot two and Josh caught his eight foot six. Um, but yeah, to start this whole thing off was I found out that there was sturgeon in the water and, um, immediately started fishing for him. So I went down to Swan Falls and there's this, there's this old fish there. His name is Sailor. And you hear oh, these yeah. <laughs> stories, old Sailor, you hear these stories all the time about, oh man, you know, a fish so legendary, it has its own name. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I got to find that, that fish. Well, so <clears throat> for sturgeon fishing, what you got to do is you, you use cut bait, you know, fresher is better. So at the time you could buy uh, salmon heads from the local supermarket, Winko. And, uh, you know, throw this on a giant hook, send it out there into the river and, uh, just soak baits. That's how you, that's how you target them. So many, many years ago, probably eight or nine years ago at this point now, um, 
I did just that through a, I mean, the, the salmon head was about the size of both of my fists. Yeeted it out into the river. Uh, a couple minutes goes by, and I'm running a, a 12 foot extra heavy action rod, uh, ugly stick, um, with 150 pound braid, and that thing just gets just absolutely demolished. Just railroad. I'm I run to the rod, rip it out of the rod holder, and I'm just I'm trying as hard as I can to lift the rod tip up so I can battle this fish. Yeah, <laughs> and I'm, I'm making no ground because he just immediately hit the current. And he has immediately started heading down river. And this thing was a, a giant. So <clears throat> I'm standing on this big bank. Oh, we fish swan. We, you and I have fish swan together. So you know the bank that I'm talking about. Mm-hmm. So I'm, I'm standing on that, that big bank up on top. And he's like dragging me in the gravel. And <clears throat> I look down river. And it was a slow motion moment, right? This, this barrel of a fish, like as big around as a 55-gallon drum, just comes leaping out of the water like a free willy moment. And I just knew, like, I have to catch that fish. I have yeah. to catch him. He's one of those fish. I have to catch Taylor. Every bit of 10 foot. Every bit of 10 foot. So he gets Oof. down the river, breaks me off. I'm heartbroken. I'm thinking, how the heck do I get after this fish? And the biggest thing that I thought was the current. You know, even if the fish didn't have all that energy, it's surface area. And it's sheer weight. How do you pull that against yeah. that current? It's like trying to pull a, a door up from the bottom. I mean, so okay, how do you how do you how do you overcome that? Well, the best way to overcome that is with a boat. And at the time, you know, I didn't have a boat. I had a kayak, and I was like, you know what? Let's take home field advantage way, and let's see what we can do about uh, uh, just getting on top of them and fighting them floating down river in the current. Mm-hmm. And I had done a bunch of research um watched a lot of youtube videos on these guys that were fishing offshore fishing the salt and i was really really cautious about you know what are these guys using uh, to stay safe so um robert field had done a thing where he was uh, shark fishing and you know he made recommendations about always having multiple ways to cut line off your off your um on your pfd so i've got my co-pilot i've got uh you got my flay knife and i've got my braid scissors it's all just easy access right on the right on the vest so the first year that i went out and it was closer towards the end of the year and i was in just a i mean i'm not gonna lie it was a it was a cheap like dick sporting goods boat uh (laughs) something i should not have been on the water on (laughs) and this was um one of the two times actually uh one of the two um moments in my life where um when i've been doing this i've been close you know I'd, i'd call it a near miss um so I was on anchor in the current, inexperienced. I was greedy. I had two rods out with 150 pound braid, Ooh. and in in the kayak is doing this in the current. I didn't I didn't know any better that the sway was a bad thing. So I'm anchored off the stern, and I'm like, oh, this is fine, this is fine. And then all of a sudden, yeah. boom, get too far sideways, roll over. I get tangled up in the line in the current. Oh, immediately geez. grab the whitewater knife, cut the line from me, lost all my gear. That was the end of the season. And, uh, and that's when I got into the Jacksons. Now, I got now into how long, how long did you wait before telling the wife that story? Uh, well, I, I told her this, <laughs> I told her, honey, why are you the, wet? Uh, I, yeah. I, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I told her what I, I told her the story and I told her, um, you know, that I was safe and I was sound, um, and that I had taken the precautionary steps to make sure mm-hmm. that I was safe if I did get tangled up. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, Honestly, I, I shouldn't have never been out there yeah. on a boat that small um, in the current in the first place. Um, so lessons learned, um, never fish with two rods out of a out of a kayak, especially for big game fish. Yeah. It, you know, you may get greedy. Don't do it. It's It's got to be a single rod setup because that fish, once you're on them, you, that's all you can do is manage yeah. that one rod. The, you can't the try. learning progression here is so interesting to me. Like, I love knowing how people kind of develop these things because like in a way you're you know I, I understand you did some some research online but you're watching big game kayak anglers in, in other arenas but you're still sort of and you're probably too humble to uh, you know to proclaim this but you're kind of like it's my understanding you, you you're sort of pioneering sturgeon fishing from a kayak at this point so it's like you know the progression is real interesting to me because you know, I like to think that people that are listening to this, like 
I, I, I would hope come away with ideas to try new things or to like expand sure. out beyond, you know, what their close to home pursuits are. But, you know, you, you put <laughs> it, what, 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 I guess the part of your progression that, that hymns me up is just the mere fact that you selected a kayak. Like why not just go with like, I don't know, a, a John boat <laughs> or like, what, what was it that made you think I should go after this 10 foot sturgeon in a, 10 foot kayak like why not a john boat or like some kind of skiff or or was this like a budget like related like was that money dictated that you you know buy that watercraft i mean why a kayak well so you know i bought that i bought that kayak and i immediately fell in love with the whole kayak bass fishing thing and i just i, I love absolutely love that and you know at the same time you know i've been in the world of engineering and manufacturing for 20 years now. And, um, where I live in Idaho, everybody is either hunting something or they're fishing something or they're doing something. And, you know, I've spent too many years behind the screen at this point. I need adventure in my life. I needed to get out there and I needed to, I needed to feel that rush. I needed to feel the hunt. I needed, I needed to chart my own course. And, um, yeah, there was guys that were catching big fish out on, uh, out, out on the salt and they had all the gear. And, but there just, there just wasn't anything for the the sturgeon. So I was like, you know, like any young kayak fisherman, I got to get on my GoPros. I got to put a YouTube channel together. I got to just start just putting it out on blast and, you know, do what I can. So <clears throat> I chose the kayak for the adventure aspect of it. And, you know, once I was hooked, once I was hooked into kayak fishing as a whole, whether it was kayak bass fishing or uh, kayak sturgeon fishing or just just for general floats i knew that i needed better gear i knew i needed better equipment because this 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 struck a chord in me this is my passion this is something that i love doing i just love the thrill of the hunt and you pull up a 400 pound fish by the side of your boat and you see that big band of silver by the side of your boat you're like yeah i I can do you if i wanted to but i'm not going to i'm gonna release you you're gonna you're gonna swim away and it's just it's just that big adrenaline rush uh that 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 speaks to that speaks to me right and um you know, it's it's a great way to disconnect from all the emails, from all the engineering mm-hmm. drawings, from all the red lines, all the mistakes, all the everything in between, right? It's a great way to just, you know, load up the kayak. You know, I've had my wife dump me off upstream on a Friday and pick me up downriver on a Sunday. And I, some of those floats are just uh, some of the best times I've had out on the river, just, you know, being out there by myself, uh, clearing my head, floating along the river, catching, uh, catching bass, catching trout, catching everything in between it's just a great way to get out so i've i fell in love with it and oh, through the years you know i've upgraded the kayaks so i went from the cuda 12 uh to the cusa um then from the cusa to the cusa fd uh jackson's first pedal drive kayak and uh, that was a big game changer right the pedals just having the pedals was a huge game changer because when i was catching them with just the paddles it was a really interesting technique you had to i mean <clears throat> you had to put the, you had to plant that rod between your knees and hold on for dear life and make mm-hmm. sure that that thing doesn't go ripping out of your out of your out of your knees and now I'd, I'd have it leashed to my life jacket just in case something did happen but uh once i got into the pedals um and the jackson specifically because you know instant forward instant reverse and you're in the current you have to be able to make split second changes yeah. uh split second steering changes so i needed a, a a prop drive that would give me that give me that ability uh so then we upgraded to the to the big rig the big rig fd and that was i mean i can't even flip that thing if i try that, that thing is so stable and uh you know now right behind me we've got the latest edition we've got the jackson kayak nar which is an extremely fast boat super responsive love the boat the thing is bl- just blazing fast and uh we just got off of a float um this past saturday last saturday and where we got into two two monster surgeons unfortunately we lost them both to you know some technical fa- failures that could happen at any time yeah. it's just the way she goes you just sometimes you just can't schwack them every single time but um it, we had a great float we caught a ton of trout a ton of smallmouth um lots of chubs uh, it, it just had a just had a fantastic float up a guest speaker from our church came out all the way from Delaware. So I was, I was so hell bent on making sure this guy uh, caught his fish. And yeah. <laughs> funny story about that. 
you know, we're, we're doing that float from CJ to, to Grandview and, um, we hook up over at the shoe fly hole or that we, the bite had been pretty light and <clears throat> we put our sterns of the kayaks on the bank and because, uh, the angler had my, the guest had lost his anchor early in the day to a, he paid out too much on the, the anchor wizard and didn't, didn't know when to stop it. So it hit the end and it just, just popped the anchor free. So yeah. we didn't have the anchor to do what we needed to do. So we had to, we had a cast from the shore and we had to make like this mile long cast to make it happen. So I, uh, you know, I load up, I send this rod just flying, you know, and whenever you go a hundred percent on a big cast with 12 ounces of weight and like a pound of meat out there, it's risky business every single time. So you mm -hmm. just hope you don't bird nest it. <laughs> and you know, that moment when that bait hit, like, you tie your woods this thing, boom, it lands perfectly right where you want it. It is right in the money zone. You know, if there's a fish there, he's going to eat it. So that's what happened. I make this cast, swishes it right into the bullseye of this eddy. And I look down at my, I look down at my reel and I'm like, oh no, <laughs> uh -huh. I got a little bit of what's going on. And, uh, I'm, I'm like, I'm, I'm sitting here and I'm trying to do this with it and paint outline. And, um, <clears throat> all of a sudden I feel it. Shwack. No, no, oh. you, can't, you can't have this happen right now. Because I'm like, I just oh, reel, I just it. reel it through. Just, just put it in the reel. Well, I, that's what I tried to do. Yeah. So, <laughs> you know, normally when this, so when sturgeon bites, sometimes or most of the time they bite like a trout, real finicky, uh -huh. right? The rod tip will just do a little bit of like you're fishing for farm trout, which is funny because they're the largest freshwater fish. You'd expect to just boom, massive takedowns every single time. That's not always the case. Yeah. So in this particular case. He hit it really hard and he knew he was hooked right away. So he had immediately started running. I started winding up some of that line and uh, started running to the bank to go get the kayak so I could get on the boat and then float on down the river with him and, you know, make up more line than I could pass the rod off. Well, I'm about 20 feet from the kayak and I'm like, Mark, Mark, throw the kayak, get, get it over here. And then the, the sturgeon just bolts and I'm like, I'm being dragged out into the river and I'm like, I'm <laughs> waist deep at this point and I'm like, I, I got to do everything I can to turn this fish. So I just bury, I give him the beans. I bury both thumbs into that reel and I'm trying to turn them. And then it boom pops the line. Uh. <laughs> so what I was getting, what I was getting to is, you know, our guest speaker, he was a pat, he's a pastor. He started a couple churches over in Delaware. And for a moment there, I forgot who I, you know, who I was fishing with. And I was like, here I am representing the treasure Valley and our congregation. And I'm, I just let out the biggest f bomb in front of this guy, and I'm like, "Oh no!" <laughs> it's like, "Oh, I got it." He's like, "I get it." You know, he saw the fish jump. The fish did jump. It was like an eight and a half, mm. nine footer, just a beast. That's of a insult fish. to injury when they do that. Give yeah. you a fleeting glimpse of what could have been. Ah, oh. yeah. But uh, yeah, I know. So it's just it's a great way to get out, target fish, and uh, get away from just the daily and uh you know when you're in their element when you're on the water with them it um it adds a level of it it, it just adds to the thrill of the hunt is what yeah. it does well for and, sure i i think the reason for that is the underlying like is like the understanding of what could go wrong i mean that that is the basis for the thrill that's what thrill seekers do but so i mean uh, aside from the the obvious of what can go wrong, like just from a safety standpoint, you know, cause it's fun to, it's fun to highlight, you know, doing dangerous things, but you know, what are, what are some of the threats that, you know, these things present? I mean, obviously they're strong enough to roll the kayak, but I understand. And you mentioned several times before they'll also jump. So, I mean, what do you, I mean, how are you contending with this and maintaining your safety simultaneously? I'm just, I'm thinking like, Cause I understand how I get when I hook into a big fish. It's like, I mean, you get so such a singular focus on catching the fish. Sometimes your own well being goes out the window. I mean, what is some things you, you know, you've kind of learned over time, you know, to position the boat a certain way, like what, what safety precautions need to be taken when you're fighting it? Cause I didn't get, you know, when we came out, you know, I don't know, maybe, maybe it's for the better that I didn't hook one from the kayak, but we caught ours <laughs> for sure. But, um, you know, what, what are some of the hazards that they present and, and precautionary steps you can take to keep yourself safe? Sure. Um, so a good survey of the water before, you know, 
understanding where slack water, where fast water is moving. Cause when you, when you're chasing sturgeon, you're, you're going to be in a river system or you're going to be up on a big reservoir system like CJ strike really. And, and, and CJ strike fish is more like a lake than it does a river system, but everywhere else, you know, everywhere else in the snake is, is going to be a river system. So you got to stay uh, aware of the currents and you have to understand how the current affects your boat, right? You're not going to go from slack water perpendicular right out into a uh, fast moving current. Cause mm-hmm you know it'll it'll do fun things to your bow it'll you know throw your bow around when you're least expecting it but uh specifically with the sturgeon um the first five the first 10 minutes of a fight you never ever leader a fish and and the reason for never leadering a fish is um it is kind of what led to that big uh we had this this video that went viral the big sturgeon jumped right next to the kayak um but the angler one thing i forgot to tell him you know, we, we talked over deep water reentry. We talked about all the swift water stuff, but I didn't tell him, I forgot to tell him, Hey, never leader the fish this early into a fight because this fish has so much energy. Yeah. And when you're on top of them directly on top of them in the first five minutes, they, they got nowhere to go, but up and these fish, they love to jump. And what you got to do is you gotta, you gotta break them down hard and you gotta break them down fast. And, but the main thing is you, you never get too close to them in the first couple minutes of the fight, right? 10 minutes on. Okay. Then, then you can start looking for um, a place to land. Them. And now on the snake river, um, the snake river is going to be a lot different from say the Columbia. Um, we're spoiled in the sense that we get to target these monster fish in a very narrow stretch of river, right? Um, we're talking a couple hundred <laughs> feet wide max, uh, with no boat traffic, right? So we're in ideal conditions, you know, guys that are fishing at Columbia, they're fishing, um, waters that are moving 200, sometimes 300,000 CFS, the snake river, uh, high flow is like 20,000 CFS. So normal flows, you know, anywhere from 8,000 to 10,000 CFS. Um, <clears throat> so it's a completely different animal. Um, Fishing on the Columbia is going to be a completely different animal. And that's, you know, that's something that I've tried once. Um, and I had to call early just because just, it would have been too dangerous at the time yeah. with the current flows, you know, anything over three mile an hour and in the, in the current, just don't even think about it. Uh, it, it's just not worth it with a fish potentially 10 feet, 10 feet long, especially up on the Columbia. But, uh, so the, the, the fight itself, um, you're going to use a pedal drive. You need to use a pedal drive. That's the safest way to do it. And preferably one that's got a prop like a Jackson um, that you can back pedal on, right? Um, you don't have to flip around with like levers and whatnot to throw the yeah. thing into reverse and then pedal. Um, so you want to have that ability to keep a safe distance. And I recommend 40 feet uh, from the fish uh, to the kayak um, in those first 10 minutes. Um, <clears throat> and essentially what you're going to be doing is just if they're getting close to you, you're going to be, you're going to be moving away and just putting pressure on them the whole time. Um, most of the time I, I would, I'd, I'd say that 99% of the time, the fish is probably going to be pulling you up river anyways. And when they're pulling you up river, just let them pull you. Cause that's going to, that's going to wear them down. Right. Yeah. You want, you want to use the river current and the weight of the kayak in your body to, you know, fight the fish. You don't need to fight them at the, with the rod and reel at that point. But once they start heading down river, um, it's going to be the fastest you'll ever go in a kayak faster than yeah. when you're on a torpedo. <laughs> it is so much fun going down river attached to a surgeon, big, big kayak. And they're just hauling. You're waking. It's just, yeah. <laughs> it is, it's such a thrill. Um, but it's, it's so, so essential. You keep your center of mass over the center line of the boat. So mm-hmm. when you're getting towards the end of the fight, say 15, 20 minutes in, um, you want to, the, the fish is going to be pretty close. You're going to be pedaling um, to a, to a nearby shore. If if the fish is like over seven feet, I always recommend you know if the shore's there, if it's three feet of water or so, you know hit the power pole, drop anchor, whatever, get out of the boat and land the fish. You know don't drag them up onto the bank. You want to get these fish hooked, uh, fought and landed uh, yeah. fast. You want to get them back in the water no more than thirty minutes. Right? It's it, you're, you're putting a lot of pressure on these fish, uh, fighting them for any longer than that. So, <clears throat> um, keeping the, you know, the last couple minutes of the fight, keeping, uh, 
the center line of the rod over the bow is is going to be essential because whatever way he's turning, he's going to pull the uh, pull the bow of the kayak in that direction, um, and you'll ultimately be back in line with that fish. But you got to be aware of the current. You got to use your core muscles. You got to use essentially your whole body, your legs, everything you got to you know fight this fish for 20, 30 minutes straight, um, and and get this fish unhooked and then landed. Um, I definitely do not recommend unhooking a big sturgeon at the side of your boat um, because of a <laughs> because of an experience that I've I've witnessed personally. It didn't happen to me, but it happened with a guy. Uh, that I was with and luckily it was on like a little four foot sturgeon but uh he was unhooking the fish he was on a hobie pa14 a big boat right so it's stable enough where he can lean up on the bow and uh unhook him so he's doing this and then the hook or the the fish thrashes a little bit and he hooks his finger oh with, no with the hook so if that fish was like an eight footer and he hooks your you know hooks your if you got gloves on if something happens and you get hooked, you're, you're going in with them. So, um, very rarely, depending on the conditions, depending on the type, uh, type of fish and where you're at, would you release them at the side of the boat? Most of the time we're going to be taking them, uh, to shallow water and, uh, anchoring down, getting out of the kayaks, getting into the water with them and releasing them, releasing them, uh, there safely. Yeah. That's, that's a really good breakdown. It's important stuff to cover because I just remember being so blown away by the sheer unimaginable power that the fish had that, that I caught. I was like, this is, this is a whole, like a completely other ball game. And, uh, <laughs> you know, it's funny. You mentioned like hooking a fish where you can't get the rod up. You know, I was like, all you want to do is get the rod vertical to a degree. And, uh, I, I, I don't know that I've ever felt maybe with a small handful of saltwater fish, but it, it, as far as freshwater goes, alligator gar, um, maybe the Gulf sturgeon, which is smaller, um, the Arapaima recently, some of the catfish out there, just nothing even compares power wise to what that thing put on me. I mean, it was everything I could do to keep my footing on solid ground. So the thought of hooking that same fish from a small boat scares me, but, um, you know, it's, it's important, obviously that you kind of have safety precautions ahead of time. And, uh, and know what you're getting yourself into because, you know, somebody like me getting out there with no coaching beforehand, wouldn't, wouldn't know these things. You know what I mean? Um, you know, it's just, it's not really a threat that you deal with, with any other fish in any other body of water, especially in fresh water. So it's a unique hazard. It's a unique challenge. Um, but yeah, man, that's, that is crazy. What I wonder too, is like, you know, it's a big river. And I'm looking, I'm like, how did you decide to fish like here? I mean, I, I did, on your kayaks, do you have like electronics? Like, are you running like depth finders? Like, where do you know? Or are you just looking for like where the water's like a, you know, an eddy is circling back? I mean, you know, how do you know when you're in the spot? Like what features um, are these fish looking for? So there's, there's, there's two types of sturgeon fisheries, um, that I'll dive into here. Um, what we had fished together was, uh, was a river system and, um, early on, you know, you're going to float a section of unknown river and you're going to map out where all the depressions are, right? You're going to make notes on your graph. You're going to make mental notes. Um, and you're going to look for these depressions because what's going to happen is these sturgeon are going to, um, in a river system on the snake. Uh, they're going to be most prevalent in the first five to 10 river miles below any one of those hydroelectric dams because they get a lot of food stuff that gets chopped up from the dam and it's easy meal, easy pickings for them um, down river. Now that biomass, that food stuff is going to fall into the depressions in the river. Okay. And what you're looking for is, is not so much just a straight flat, but you're looking for something that's going to dip down and you're going to mark the head of the hole, mark the tail of the hole. And you're going to fish that hole thoroughly, right? You're going to start at the head of the hole uh, so that any scent trails goes downriver. If anything's interested in biting, it'll swim up to the head of the hole and eat it. Um, if you're not having any good luck at the head of the hole, fish the tail of the hole and, you know, just fish it thoroughly. But um, on the on the river systems, once you float it a couple of times, you're going to know where all these depressions are and you can leave the electronics at home. That is not the case for fish in the reservoir. Fishing a reservoir, uh, or even say like the Columbia, um, these big bodies of water, 
a sonar is essential. Side scan is essential. Now, mm. side scan is a great tool um, just for looking at the contours, looking at what's going on down down below you, both left and right of you. But for sturgeon fishing, it's essential. And normally, you can't see fish on the on the side scan like clear as day. Sturgeon, they're so massive, they stand out. Yeah. You can <laughs> immediately see them. You're like, that's sturgeon. I know you can like see that they have so much mass to them. You, you just know. So when you're on the reservoir, you're using your side scan unit and you're looking for these pods of sturgeon. All right. You're going to be looking for about 10 or so uh, that are moving as a pod. And um, they're going to look like grains of rice on, you know, about 60 foot deep. Uh, you find those grains of rice. Uh, you switch over to your, your, your chirp, you get over on top of them, you drop baits. And that's, that's typically how reservoir fishing, reservoir fishing is done. But the river system, river system is completely different. Leave all your electronics at home, have a good understanding of the water, uh, you know, know where these fish are going to be laying. Because if they're not in those holes, they're going to be transiting. They're going to be transiting from one hole to the other. And, um, you know, you can set up in certain areas and catch those transiting fish. But uh, more often than not, they're just going to be hunkered down in these uh, these depressions. Uh, so it's a matter of finding these depressions and then uh, so you know doing your due diligence, soaking bait, and uh, with a little bit of luck, you're going to get into a monster. Yeah. Well, my big takeaway on that style of fishing was like you know there's these different categories of the experience of fishing where it's like. You know, it's your leisurely afternoon. It's, you know, it, a little bit of work involved. But, like, there's there's just certain fish out there, species-wise, where it's, like, the experience is, like, transcendent of, I don't know. what I don't know what, I, I, don't, I don't necessarily want to say, like, normal fishing. But it's like you cross this threshold into a different territory when you start chasing these kind of fish where it's like it, the, it, like the experience, I know we've used the word adventure, but it's like, you really feel like you're hunting or like you're on this adventure. Like you're not fishing anymore in the traditional sense. And, um, you know, I, I just, I, obviously I approached my experience with you. So, and, you know, open-minded and, you know, I, I feel like I've always been the type that's good at kind of getting out of my own way and like following the lead of the subject matter expert, because somebody like me, when it comes to adventures, like, and left to my own devices, I'll sometimes just cannonball into things in a reckless manner. And, you know, we've talked about this before, like my gear, thank God my gear held up to the task of catching oh, the fish. Man. I know we joked about all my uni knots that are in my reels. I got, <laughs> I'm going to have four different... You know, I think I, I might have even had two different line classes tied together within my spool. But, uh, you know, uh, it is important when you start chasing fish that size to be organized, to be, you know, smart with your gear. Obviously, the gear you need is big. Now, you put somebody like yourself and Josh, especially y'all are big boys. And then and then me, we, you know, we kind of snugged up into the car. Uh, <laughs> me, when I go fishing, man. I just throw all my crap in the back of the car. I got broken rod tips, missing guides. My gear's all beat up and scratched because I'm just throwing stuff in there. But it's not the way to do it. Now, what I was so impressed about with you was like the creative and just like analytical approach that you have towards fishing. Maybe it's the engineering mindset, but we really shoulder on, on that strength that you have because Josh is probably a little bit more geared like me where it's just, you know, I don't know, put your shoulder down and run through the challenge, but that doesn't always work. You have to be smart and you have to be calculated. Um, so some of the devices that you have, and I know I'm going on a tangent here, but it's important to note like the human behind the rod and reel, you know what I mean? Um, sure. some of your, I don't know, your creations <laughs> it blew my mind. Like some of the things that you have built, you know, it's a, it's fascinating when you know, like, people's skills beyond fishing, you know, because earlier you mentioned that fishing for you was kind of like a separation from work, but for yep. you to be able to somehow tie those two talents together is interesting to me. You know what I mean? Maybe I'm thinking into this too much, but the devices that you have, like what you did with camera gear, I still don't know how you did it. Those angles that you have with Josh, where y'all cast the camera and somehow it like, rotates in midair and stays focused on the angler i don't know how you did it but oh, you know I, I, I i'm 
I promise I'm getting to the point here. You know, I, I'm gloating over your talents because they're like important to note beyond catching a big fish. I was so blown away at the fact that a lot of the stuff we used were things that you built by hand. Like I want to stress this to people that are listening. <laughs> we, you know, you got these three grown men packed into a small car and we got to haul all these kayaks and gear and fishing rods. And to do that in an organized way is, is not easy, but what you built like with the, uh, the trailer that you fabricated and I can see the stuff in the background. It's an interesting topic. And it's something when I, that I want to get into because I understand now you've kind of circled back and began using like, I don't know, the engineering skills to facilitate, I don't know, to, to benefit yourself on a personal level, but also to potentially benefit other anglers who have ambitions of doing these things. So sure, I want yeah. to know more about the business side of this that you've started to venture into because it's like you, you had just started to kind of lay the groundwork for it while we were out there. And I was just like so impressed by the craftsmanship of the rod lockers, of the trailers that you're building. So tell me how that has started to develop and some of the things that you're starting to do now with Snake River Lockers. Well, thank you for bringing that up. Yes. Um, so Snake River Lockers is a company that I formed um, earlier this year. Uh, February is when we officially kicked off the LLC. And um, so for me, I fish in some of these remote areas, very difficult to get to, um, you know, dirt roads, uh, driving along train tracks. You know, you, you got to get... You got to get your gear there in one piece. So um, we had a we had a bass fishing tournament. I was going up there with another angler. We were carpooling, and uh, I did not want to put twelve rods in the car and drive four hundred miles. I was done with it, and we're not doing yeah. that. So I, uh, you know, quickly fabricated a um, or designed a, a a gear locker out of a single sheet of steel. It was a four foot by ten foot uh, sheet of steel, and you know, it had these. Uh, you know, it was a 16 gauge galvanil construction, um, <clears throat> powder coated. We had a uh, C deck liner on the inside. Uh, we had two doors that would fold down that would then turn into tables. So then you could, uh, you know, use your laptop and program your head unit while you're there at the ramp. And, <clears throat> you know, so we threw all of our, we threw all 12 rods into that rod locker, six going one way, six going the other way. And it made life so much easier. And our rods got there in one piece. Everything was safe and sound. We have these awesome rod stators on the inside. Uh, that bungee your 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 equipment down they're not going anywhere and everything around it is is sea deck um is like that foam marine mat so yeah. if it you know bumps up and down the road it, it's not going to get you're not marring up the finish pan on your casting reel so um i started building these lockers and started testing them and i've, I've built quite a few of them i've given some of them away as i've as i worked on prototypes and um uh, you know, we've, we've taken a, about a year and a half worth of lessons learned and we've developed, um, line lockers. Now the, the, the website is snakeriverlocker.com and that is the core product line. The, the core of the product line is to build equipment boxes and gear boxes, uh, to, to serve the industry needs and specifically tailored, uh, to fishing rods. So we have uh, side mount lockers, we have top mount lockers, and we've also got a, a line of um, uh, kayak motor lockers. We've got um, a line of, uh, it, it's a rod pod, which essentially sits on the back end of a six inch or eight inch PVC tube, which uh, gives you an increased capacity. So you can now stuff more rods and reels into your existing um, uh, rod uh, storage solution. So we're developing these product lines and we're getting ready to to post them onto the website. Uh, right now, what we have is just the one trailer with the one locker uh, mounted on it on on the website on uh, snakecoverlocker.com. But uh, here in a couple of weeks, we're going to be launching uh, about we're, we're launching five lockers and then two trailer systems. Um, so the trailers, it's it's funny, you know, we started the company building lockers and. We needed a, we needed something sexy to put these things on, right? Because the regular kayak trailer just was they're just you know you can convert a jet ski trailer, you can take a harbor freight trailer, you can do all these things, but there's just so much work. I needed to develop a platform that would allow me to transport my rods, my reels, and my kayak, multiple kayaks, uh, safely. Um, so 
we we built a couple of prototype trailers. We we tested them. We put them through their paces, and what we ultimately wound up with was a was a design that solves so many engineering problems, so many industry problems that um, that you know we're going to start mass producing these things, and we're going to start serving the Pacific Northwest. We're going to serve California. We're going to serve uh, just anywhere on the West Coast. Um, we now have this line of trailers and these, in these lockers to uh, serve that upper end market guys that want, you know, a high quality trailer system um, <clears throat> with features that are important to them. Right. This specific trailer system um, that's sitting behind me has a, has a very unique frame in such that the boat is going to sit down below the fenders. Uh, it's going to sit very low to the, to the, to the, ground and that's going to make wet launching so much easier no okay. but what it also what it also does is you know we talk about kayak trailers most kayak trailers are just going to come with two rails right and what happens is this thing called hold deformation it's this unspoken thing people realize it they know it's a problem but no one really talks about it well we've identified that problem and we we solved that problem so our trailer systems allow a two rail system with the addition of bumper rails, so you could have a quad rail system uh, for guys that are, say, on natives where their 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 rows or their rails are really narrow. Well, you put straps on the outside rails of that kayak, and in the hot summer sun, it's going to want to want to bow that kayak over those rails. So the 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 frame geometry is such that it lends itself very well to put these bumper rails on, which will support the middle of the kayak and prevent hull deformation. Now that so was a big a, question of mine. Like uh, while you're talking, I'm sort of envisioning my climate here in Florida, where you just get this unbelievable heat in the summer. And I'm sitting here thinking like, man, I have seen kayaks here fold over like they're melted in the hot summer sun. And I, I quite frankly think, and there's a kayak fishing is a massive scene, even where I'm at in the Everglades and all through South, throughout South Florida, you got kayak anglers everywhere who would be interested in this type of thing, especially, but I know most guys aren't taking their kayak off of the trailer. They're leaving it on there 24 seven all throughout the year. Whenever it's not in use strapped to the trailer in the sun. So when you're describing this, I'm thinking, okay, but like, how are you, like, how are you, how are you thinking ahead to, you know, this thing taking form to what it's up against, but you sort of answered my question before I could even get to it. So you've already taken into <laughs> consideration, you know, that's the beauty of this. I think of products, like I'm always a skeptic with, with anything fishing related, especially when it's a product that, you know, if it gets pitched to me, I'm like, okay, but let me see the fish you catch. You know, I, that's how I think, you know what I mean? I go straight to challenging that person's acumen on the water. You know what I mean? Okay, that's great. You can design something that somebody else gave you an idea about, but are you putting in the time on the water? Like, are you out there in, like testing the product? But the oh, fact that you, the fact absolutely. that you are, yeah, that's what, that's what I can appreciate out about what you're doing is like you, you have done the trial and error. You've approached this thing as the angler who's got the mindset of the engineer. So this is an angler a diehard angler who has big fish experience that's designing this. So that's, that's interesting to me. The other side of that thing. And I'm going to, I apologize for getting ahead of you. I get excited when I think about this stuff. We have the unique issue where I met of like salt water and just how damaging salt water can be. I don't know what like material you might've mentioned what material you, that you're fabricating this out of, but like, how, how could you, are you doing anything like preventative wise or to combat, I don't know, something that can handle the beating that salt water can put on, you know, on, on a trailer. Obviously smart people are going to wash it down regardless, but I'm thinking like rod lockers and, and all that with salt water. Yep. So we're, um, <clears throat> so our, our specific coating on our trailer. Now this is a, this is a carbon steel frame trailer. Um, but what it, what it does have, it has a zinc based primer powder coat. And what that's going to do is it's a very specific powder coat, uh, primer that is meant for, uh, boat trailers, right? So we're going to, we're going to powder coat it every, every square inch of this thing. And it, it's going to be blasted to, uh, to a, a bright white finish. It gets this, uh, primer powder coat on it. And then it gets baked again with this, uh, 
consider right finish. I'm calling it snow goose, but it's a textured finish. Um, <clears throat> helps break up that surface texture so that if, uh, you know, if you got like a gloss finish and you get scratch in it, it's going to stand out. But, you know, with a textured finish, it's going to really hide a lot of the uh, potential rock chips that you're going to face, you know, mm -hmm. traveling all over the place. Um, so saltwater, we've got some additional testing that we need to do. Um, but as far as like all of our terminal connections are uh, concerned, every single one of our connections that are made is made with a soldered heat shrunk and then heat wrapped connection. And then every connection for ground is hit with a uh, anti-fouling uh, grease and then coated with uh, a silicone over it. So to prevent any kind of uh, galvanic corrosion from happening uh, from in and out of the water. Now, what, what we need to do is I need to spend some time out on the salt and see how the current trailer system uh, works with that, um, you know, with the salt water. Um, but we will develop a bulletproof saltwater trailer system that will be, you know, specifically targeted at the uh, anglers along the coast. Um, but ultimately, what I'm building is something that I'm putting my name on. I'm standing behind my my product 100%. You yeah. know, we're taking all of our all of our drawings, all of our 3D models, and we're getting them uh, certified through a structural engineer, an independent third party. Um, we're doing FEA analysis to see the life life cycle of, you know, how many times can a, a person cross the country before we start to see any kind of material fatigue, any kind of potential weldment failure. Um, <clears throat> so we're working very closely with uh, structural engineers in Boise uh, to, to develop our system. So it's not, you know, we, we've taken an idea and we've engineered it and we've gotten it approved and we have a, an engineered metal solution for um, transporting goods, transporting kayaks, transporting rods. Um, but our coatings are second to none. You're right. This is a premium coating. Uh, it'll be available in multiple different color options. Uh, the base option is this, uh, it's a hammered, uh, black and gray with silver highlight texture. It is absolutely beautiful in person. Pictures just really just don't do it justice. You have to see it. You have to feel it, uh, to know the quality that is in this paint finish. And now I've partnered with, um, <clears throat> some powder coaters who have many, many decades of experience and have leaned on those subject matter experts to help make the decisions that I've made for the proper coating process um, uh, for, for these, for this equipment. Now the lockers themselves are going to be going to an aluminum grade. They're going to be going to an aluminum material um, for a couple of reasons. Corrosion. We've seen with our first boxes that were built out of galvanil that were powder coated. Um, they would get chipped and, you know, certain areas would develop, you know, small signs of rust. I don't want that. I don't want that at all. So we eliminate that problem entirely by going to an aluminum body. So we go with a, um, a an aluminum 090 thickness, uh, very sturdy construction. And it's a single, single door panel now. So the full door of the 98 inch wide box opens up so you can just push your rods in. You don't have to feed them through one end or the other. Um, <clears throat> But, uh, yeah, the aluminum will solve a lot of those corrosion problems that we experienced in the first couple of years of doing this. The, the rod boxes are really draw me in. Um, yeah, I, I don't know if I told you this. So when I first moved to Florida, like literally within the first week, I actually had 90% of my rods stolen from the back of my Jeep. So they were taken. So I was, you know, the idea of having somewhere I can lock them up and keep them safe is, is important to me. I mean, without your gear, you're, you're, you're done. You, you need, you, sure. you got to keep it protected, obviously from taking a beating and getting broken, but also from getting stolen. But now like, you know, when I think of a rod tube, I, I've seen them on like top of cars and stuff, but there's like, you got to disassemble the rod you, when you get to the water's edge, then you got to put your reel on string the line do your rigging up your rod boxes. I'm not can kind of see it in the background. Can a fully rigged out rod and reel that's already got lures or rigs or whatever be fit into that? Or is it like, can it, can it take a rod that has reels on it? And if so, oh. like how many? So absolutely. So our first, our first, um, locker was uh 13 and a half inches high, uh, uh, eight and a half, uh, nine inches. I believe it was nine inches deep. And, um, we were able to put 12 rods in there, right? Six going one way, six going the other way. And uh, fully, fully rigged. All your lures line didn't have to touch anything, right? You show up to the ramp, you drop the door, you undo the bungee, boom, you're 
rods ready to go. Um, and that's, that's what this system provides is it, it allows you to pull it to the ramp quickly. You got lights inside your box. You can see what you're doing on those early morning oh, days. You got, yeah. you got lights on the trailer. You got rigging lights. You got reverse lights. You got, you can see the thing from the international space station. You have all <laughs> lights that you'd want. And that's so incredibly important, um, for minimizing ramp time. So when I designed this trailer system, a couple core things were, um, uh, had to, had to be met, right? We needed to be able to put our rods into the black packs, into the back of the kayaks, staged up vertically. And then we need to be able to wet launch without getting out of the vehicle. I want, I wanted the goal to be able to back the trailer up, launch the boat, pull forward and my rods and my gear and everything is already on my boat and the bow is on the ramp. So the way we do that is you pull up to the ramp, you drop the door for your rod locker, you pull your rods out of their sleeves, you put them into the the, the rod box while you're still in the parking spot. You throw all your gear that you're going to take into the, the tackle or into the black packs, throw your net on there, throw everything you're going to need. And then you take the two over, you, you take the two straps off the, the main body of the kayak now the bow of the kayak has got a third uh anchoring point down to the um uh down to the winch um so what you're going to do is you're going to put about 20 foot of cordage from from your bow to the uh winch so <clears throat> when you get down to the ramp uh the bow will come or you'll unclip the bow and you'll have all this t- cordage spooled up uh on your on the bow of your kayak so you're going to quickly reverse into the water you're going to pop you're going to stop and the back the kayak's going to float off of the trailer system and then you're going to slowly pull forward and when you pull forward that lo- that line's going to pay off the bow of the kayak and you're going to pull that whole boat and everything back up onto the ramp so what you just, what you've just done is you've taken a process that would have normally taken 10 maybe 15 minutes if you had to pack your kayak down and pack all your gear down pack your rods down you do it all up at the parking spot with the comfort of all having all that light and all that rigging light you, you launch or you load everything onto the kayak trailer you back it into the water like a regular boat you pull out like a regular boat your your kayak is now just firmly planted on the on the uh, on the boat ramp Go park your trailer, come back, hop in, and away you go. Minimizing ramp time, especially for those tournament anglers, is so important, yeah. right? You do not, like, you know, some of these big events that have 150 anglers, you cannot be clogging up that ramp. You absolutely cannot. Um, <clears throat> so this this system provides that. So um, the 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 rails on here have multiple height settings, right? So you can go high and low. You can go in and out to customize however you want to your kayak on um, the low setting, the keel of your kayak, the lowest point on say my big rig or my NAR sits 17 inches from the, from the road surface to the bottom of the keel. So that's very, very low. So shallow water ramps are a thing of the past, right? I'm no longer worried about these, you know, is the ramp deep enough? Well, mm-hmm. I've got a trailer that has a U frame to it and it allows me to just launch this thing like a regular boat and not worry about it. So, um, those, those core things were all important. They were all factored into the design and, um, expandability, right? So a lot of these, uh, or this particular model of trailer comes with, uh, these big brackets on the side and it comes with all these accessory mounting holes up on the top and on the angled components so that you can bolt on additional brackets. You can bolt on, um, a, uh, anchor was, or a anchor power pole anchor, uh, pole uh to the overhead rack you can put an additional uh bunk stager up on the top you can put a another ca- you can put a cargo locker on top in this kind of point right here you could put a cargo box in here and then you can run your 12 volt 20 amp service off your seven pin up to there and you can charge all your your uh batteries in the cargo locker uh, on top of the trailer so there's just there's so many things that you yeah. can do so many different ways you can expand these trailers um, and adapt them to your specific kayak. So, um, this is, this is the NAR behind me and it's almost a 14 foot boat. I think it's like 13, eight or something like that. And it, it fits wonderfully on this kayak trailer. Um, the bow stop and the spare tire mount up here on the front, um, they just grab they they bolt around the tongue so you can index them forward or back so that you can perfectly center the center of gravity of, of your kayak where you want it over the wheels. 
so that you can get the best ride possible. So you're not locked into a specific, oh, you bought this trailer and it's, you know, you can't custom tailor it to your yeah. hobby or, you know, you go to something else. You can adapt this kayak trailer to do, uh, you know, haul a NAR, haul a big rig, haul uh, a native, haul a Hobie. You can haul anything. And we've we've taken a lot of the uh, 3D, we've made 3D models of every one of these kayaks and we've simulated them on the trailers and we've found the best positions for them. And we, we've we've made sure that the guys that are on those those high-end boats have the confidence that this trailer system was built with those guys in mind, with their needs yeah. in mind. Um, with all the features that they may additionally want down the road, you know, already ready to go. They can add to it as they see fit. That's awesome. Yeah. Because it's, I mean, it's clear to me that this isn't just some system of rails and cross beams that were welded together and slap some wheels on there. And, you know, if it fits, strap it down and go. It's a lot of the kayak anglers. It's not a world that I've really gone into, but I admire the ability that a lot of the diehard kayak guys that I know have to like take a lot of gear and like crunch it into a very specific system because you're so crunched for space. It's like you want to maximize your capabilities in a minimized amount of space. So I know that like, you know, the fact that you use that mindset to where, you know, and a lot of the kayak guys that I know too is like they have customized their rig to be unique to what they like to do. It's like, you know what I mean? I, I love the, it's almost like the Swiss army knife of, you know, fishing rigs. So the fact that you can do the same thing with the trailer is interesting to me, you know, cause I can see the rod locker in the back in my first thing I'm thinking, okay, but like, is it, is it welded to the frame is, or is it something that can be detachable and say, Oh, I want it on this side or I want it on that side. It's like, so they're able to just really maneuver this thing and change it and custom it to their liking to a degree. It sounds like. Absolutely. And with the future rod pod uh, lockers that we're going to be launching shortly, you can take your existing rod tubes, your six inch or eight inch PVC, and you put one of my lockers on the end of it. And what it's going to do is it's going to open up that end of that PVC lock, that PVC tube that you already have. It's already stickered up. It's already logoed up. You don't want to get rid of it. You know, for not a whole lot of money, you bolt this thing onto the side of your trailer, bolt it onto the end of your uh, PVC tube, and now you have that space for all your reels, and you have that padded mm -hmm. interior liner. You have those lights, and the the end of the box, the end of the rod pod box, and the side of the pod. Uh, that door is a, a unibody door, so when you open it, it opens. You you can either load it directly from the back, or you can load it from the side. It gives you a ton of room to stage all your equipment and know that it's going to be secure it's not going to be sliding forward it's not going to be sliding back because they're going to be mounted to these arms that are going to be holding the 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 rod butts you're not going to slide it forward you don't have to worry about putting padding up in the front of the pvc uh broad tube anymore yeah uh, so we've 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 thought about a lot of different ways on how to uh, market lockers to guys that may already have lockers that just want that are tired of having to take the reels off that are tired of having to reline at the ramp. Um, so this solves a lot of those, those issues. Those are all issues that I've dealt with in the past. And, you know, um, I've taken what I've learned as a production engineer, as a manufacturing engineer and applied it to, um, uh, something that I'm passionate about. The other cool thing I want to talk about is, you know, when it comes to manufacturing, lean manufacturing, right? How can you do things better? Well, so these trailer systems here and all, every single hole that's on these trailers. So this is all coming off of a structural laser uh, cutter, right? So what it does is it takes a 40 foot stick of steel and it takes the 3D part with all of the holes in it. And it specifically cuts those holes out um, so that we get the exact same part every single time. There's no room for human mm -hmm. error because it's a robot that's making these parts. And then we throw those parts onto a jig and fixture table, right? It's a peg table and you have your jigs ready to go. We can ensure consistency and we can ensure quality and we can guarantee that this thing is going to be the last trailer that you're ever going to need to buy because it is built from the ground up with quality, with a lifetime in mind. I only want you to have to buy one of these things once, unless you're, you know, buying one for a friend or buying one to, for the rest of your fleet, yeah. by all means, but <laughs> You know, I, you know, I'm standing behind this thing. We're using premium components, Dexter axles, radial tires. I mean, <clears throat> no, no, no cost cutting corners were, were, were made here. And we try to buy 
we buy our steel. It's all bought American, right? So all of the steel that is in these trailers, um, it is all domestically sourced and it's all domestically produced. So we do have to use some globally sourced components um, to keep other costs down. But uh, the core frame of the trailer is, is, is all by American, built American, designed and manufactured here in America. That's awesome. Well, I, I can speak from experience or at least, you know, I, I spent a little bit of time with you in your garage and uh, man, I, I, I was impressed at how much, how, I don't know, you took a very concerted like approach towards making sure that that trailer that you had built for our trip was like absolute perfection. And I'm sitting there thinking like, it's good enough, but no, like you, <laughs> I can tell that you take like, like, you know, there's pride in work and then there's like an intensity. Like you were so intense about ensuring everything was right and safe and perfect and quality. And like, you know, I don't know, man, like, I guess like if you're a kayak angler that really loves their gear and, and you want to be absolutely certain, you're not going to have a failure. It's good to know that like the person that's built the parts, one, it comes from the same mindset as you and also spends time on the water. So knows like what, where your priorities lie. But, um, yeah, man, I can speak from experience for what it's worth to anybody listening that that you you're not just throwing together gear and trying to like mass produce and throwing a bunch of stuff out there. I can tell you take a tremendous pride in the work that that you do. And it and it's it's showy too. You know what I mean? It's 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 good looking gear. Like that stuff looks sharp. I know you probably turn a lot of heads on the highway because the thing looks <laughs> awesome. I was like, oh my gosh, I need something like, you know, I'm like, he, you need to make something like that for my canoes. I don't have kayaks. I have, I'm a canoe guy, but, <laughs> but um, like, you know, we're, we're, we're talking about all this, but remind people too, like where they can go to see it because people who have questions about, you know, how, how it's being shipped, you know, maybe somebody from Florida is listening. It's like, shoot, man, I need something like that for me. I mean, are you at a point now where you're, where you're uh, what's the word for it? Shipping things that far or is it is it strictly local like where are you at right now as far as your reach with with shipping and customers and people who want to make inquiries how could they reach you like that side of things so the the so what i would do is i direct any potential customer to uh, the snakeriverlocker.com website and there you'll find the specifications the all the product specifications on the the trailer system and all the future uh, lockers and additional trailer systems that are going, going to be coming out we have an instagram as well snake river lockers uh, we post a lot of uh, of our adventures uh, on the on the instagram uh, we also have a Facebook page as well, so you can reach out to me directly through the Facebook page. Um, but one of the biggest things, one of the biggest problems that I have with uh, the kayak trailer market in general is just the sheer lead time. So when you order a trailer, sometimes it'll take six months to get it. And mm -hmm. on my website, it says that our mission is to be able to deliver a trailer to you within 45 days, if not sooner, from your initial order. And how wow. we achieve that... <laughs> How we achieve that is through standardized processes and standardized production. So by standardizing the laser cutting uh, portion of our builds, we're able to ensure consistency and quality, but we're also able to build to inventory. So by standardizing the product line and uh, identifying which features can be bolt on and which features need to be welded on, um, we can develop a standard trailer system so that when we build to inventory, we sell out of inventory and uh, build to replace that inventory. So when you place an order and we have an inventory of say 10 trailers, you know, come on down, come pick it up. You know, we're a couple hundred miles away from California or a couple hundred miles away from Oregon or Washington. Um, you're going to pull up to the, pull up to the shop and, you know, hitch up and away you go. You'll have your manufacturer statement of origin. You'll have your uh, VIN number uh, and you'll be ready to rock and roll. And that's so important because if I'm spending a lot of money on a system, I want that system right away, right? This society, this, this day and age that we live in is instant gratification. You buy it, you want it. You don't want to wait an entire season to get it. So we're solving that production supply chain issue by, you know, making a massive investment and building a massive amount of inventory for these single wides and these double wides. Yeah. Um, and, and we can do that confidently so that each trailer is not custom built. Um, you can further customize them with bolt on attachments. So that's why we've uh, put on key locations uh, for 
uh, specific mounting holes so that you could buy additional brackets so that you could mount additional components to it and they would just easily bolt on they would easily retrofit on um, so you don't have to you know buy something that uh, you know I, I wish i had this but my trailer got all welded together and it didn't have this specific bracket on so we've identified which features get welded on which features uh, can be bolted on so that you can really truly make it your own uh, through further customizations with different bracketing, different uh, carrier solutions, but the core of the geometry, the core trailer systems will, will be standardized and then you can take it from there. And that, that right there allows us to build to inventory and allows us to uh, stand by our 45 day or less lead time when it comes to uh, these, these trailer systems. So um, that's, that's one of the biggest things for me is, um, you know, what's currently out there on the market right now, it's going to take you six months to get it. And, uh, you know, I'm not happy with that. So we're, we're building up a lot of inventory right now for the 2024 season, you know, guys are going to get their tax returns and we're going to ensure that we have, um, you know, a fleet of our double wides and our single wides. And it's a, it's a big, many, many thousands and thousands of dollars, uh, investment to make that happen. But I'm so confident in this system and I stand behind this system. I know I use it. I put this thing through its paces. I've taken it through the desert. I've taken it down crazy embankments. I've, you know, we've taken it all over the place and we have beat the literal dog piss out of this thing, testing it. And I can guarantee <laughs> you that uh, you, you're not going to put any more pressure or put this in any other situation than, than 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 we have taken it all over the back country of idaho and all over this entire state it's a phenomenal system and it's extremely reliable that's awesome man snake i'm going to throw all this up on the screen by the way it'll be in the description below it'll be up on the screen for anybody watching it'll be easy to find but uh you know i know steve i know you're a, a kind of a detail-oriented guy i'm not great with detail so i want to make sure as we're wrapping this thing up that i'm not missing any additional details that I may have forgotten, um, you know, if there's anything else, let me know. But obviously anybody who's listening, who has questions that I couldn't think of, you know, I think you're, I think you're a pretty receptive guy to questions, responsive, those kinds yeah. of things. Absolutely. You know, we've, um, we've reached out to, um, uh, specific experts in the the kayaking field uh that even outside of my uh kayak sturgeon fishing experience um guys that are really deep into the kayak bass fishing experience um and ask them many different questions on hey what's important to you what are the features that are important to you and we've taken you know a dozen or so of these uh you know very ingrained individuals that these are my wants these are my needs these are my wishes this is what i think i need this thing to do this is what i need this thing to do and we've encapsulated that into the design uh so the the dimensions of the the dimensions of the kayak trailer the, the size of the trailer the the position of the kayak on the trailer whatever kayak that you have on it the future adaptability all those things were all considered that went in, that went into this design and then on top of that it went into a um you know, a, a, a third party structural review uh, for independent verification that this thing is built to last. You know, we, we're going to stand behind this, you know, any features or, you know, any potential failures that you have in the frame, you know, bring it back, we'll replace it. But I can guarantee you that with the the loads that we've calculated and the, the, the weldments that we put on here, you're going to be set for life. That's awesome, man. Well, I know a lot of guys listening to this. I mean, I've got anglers from around the country that uh you know do a lot of different applications but the kayak the kayak community is big and it's only growing more and a lot of the guys who do it listening so i would strongly urge those guys in particular to check out your website reach out to you because the product is designed by one of us you know what i mean a real angler um phenomenal stuff and i, I still i'm gonna keep bugging you about getting me one of them rod lockers i can strap to the top of the jeep i know that thing would look sharp on the jeep but uh all in all in due time but steve man unless i have forgotten any uh key points to bring up i want to say i appreciate your time and uh and and i know you got to get back home to the the family and the and the little ones yeah absolutely no i i can't thank you enough for having me on your show and you know what david when we were out there on the water i could tell you know from both you and josh that you guys are extremely passionate about uh, the, the fishing that you do. And I wanted to make sure you guys had a world-class experience. And I'm glad that we had that opportunity to connect on the snake river and you guys got to just stick absolute pigs, not to mention 
we did it at the same time. Yeah, <laughs> that was a that was a landmark catch for me. Like I can't, I'm not, I, I can't conflate it. It was my largest fish that I've ever caught in my entire life, and so like that was, it, it was like, you know, it's just one of those like those uh Mount Rushmore type catches for me in my experiences in England. I, I, I can't. I mean, I I owe you everything because you just. I mean, I'm just a guy holding the rod. You put us in front of them. You called the shots. You said what it was going to be. And, uh, I mean, you're an amazing host. So you coming onto this podcast is the, is the least that, that I could do. And I'm benefiting from this as well. Cause, um, uh, you're definitely, I mean, solid guy. I would trust my gear on what you've built a hundred thousand percent. So yeah, man. Thank you very much, David. And I really appreciate you. And thank you all. Thank you all for listening and uh, tuning in. And uh, yes, feel free to check out Snake River Lockers. Uh, check back here in a couple of weeks when we do post all of our um, uh, complete locker lineup, our rod pods, our cargo lockers, our top mount lockers, our side mount lockers, our double wides. And then uh, we have our single wide right, right now that's on the site. Um, but uh, right, just just know that we're continually to continually growing. Uh, we're we're taking a ton of orders right now. Uh, we're also building to inventory and uh, we, we've taken as much feedback as we could possibly get from the professional bass fishing uh, tournament anglers from guys that are just going out and doing any, any kind of uh, adventuring that want to maybe adapt their system to uh, kayak camping or, or just, uh, just any kind of leisurely uh, uh, outing uh, this system <clears throat> this is going to solve so many of your problems and you're not going to have any, any potential, uh, anything to worry about when it comes going down the road, because you know, at the core of this, this has been designed by an angler who needs to trust his gear in the middle of the wilderness. I cannot have a gear, gear, gear failure. So we're using the, the most premium components that we can source and we're designing, uh, <clears throat> we're designing these systems so that they can last a lifetime. Yeah, man. Well, Steve, I appreciate your time and I, and I wish you all the, all the best success, um, as the business, you know, I, I imagine is going to take off as soon as pe see people see the quality and the looks, you know, sometimes people are all about the looks, but the stuff just looks phenomenal and the quality is there. So Steve, man, I appreciate your time. And, I'll tell uh, you what, if you drive out here with that Jeep of yours, and then you <laughs> can come pick up one of your top Mount lockers. I've got one waiting for you. Awesome. I may have we'll do to another, do that. We're doing another kayak sturgeon fishing trip. Ah, hey, we'll, we we're, we're coming up on the one year anniversary of it. Maybe, <laughs> maybe we'll do round two. I'll go after bridge runner or one of these bridge. other, uh, local legendary fish <laughs> bridge, bridge runner or old sailor. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> All right, Steve, Thanks, I appreciate David. your time, man. Thank Thanks. you very much. Thank you for listening to boundless pursuit. Tune in each week as we bring stories and insight from uniquely talented anglers and outdoorsmen. And if you enjoyed this show, I want to hear from you. Be sure to leave a five-star review as this is going to drive the growth and exposure of this show. And if you have feedback or guest suggestions, I would love to hear from you. And you can reach me at boundlesspursuitfishing at gmail.com. For all other collections of media and contact information, please visit www.boundless-pursuit.com.